brought the war on was the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife in the uh, Bosnian capital of Sarajevo. Now Bosnia was part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, but right next to the country of Bosnia was Serbia, which did not want the Austrians involved in that area. And so the assassination came from them, uh, essentially in Bosnia. Austria-Hungary made demands that were unacceptable to the Kingdom of Serbia. Their irreconcilable differences compounded to mobilize both countries for war. And their associated alliances with Germany, in the case of Austria-Hungary, and with Russia, in the case of Serbia, triggered a mobilization across Europe in July of 1914 that ultimately produced decisions, especially by Austria-Hungary and also by Germany, to launch war. By 1917, most Americans had come to the decision that Germany was an aggressor. It was an aggressor because it was sinking uh, neutral vessels as well as uh, civilian passenger liners of, of allied neutrality on the high seas. By the end of 1916 and early 1917, Americans started to become aware of even greater cruelties inflicted by the German soldiers in occupied Belgium and northern France. They all, and they started a rally against this. And then one of the deciding factors in addition to this was the, the, what's called the Zimmermann Telegram, where the German government was basically trying to encourage the governments of Mexico and even Japan to attack the United States. And collectively, the weight of Germany's actions on the high seas, Germany's actions to implicate uh, attacks on the western and southern uh, United States borders, suggested that the war was going to enlarge and continue to degenerate. After trying to secure peace on, by Woodrow Wilson, the American president, uh, he had not been successful uh, in a number of, of these peace proposals. And he comes to the conclusion that if the United States is to play a, a key role in the post-war peace treaty and negotiations, it needed to be an active participant. The advisors to the president finally swayed him to actually ask Congress to declare war on Germany. And when that happens, they then realize that they're unprepared at this stage to be starting to send troops immediately over to Europe. It will be a buildup that will take um, quite a while, maybe uh, a year or more. My grandfather was, was really a, a farmer, and he was he was drafted in the in the uh, first draft. Uh, America had to turn to the draft. Suddenly, they were uh, after the declaration of war in April 1917. They were engaged in this uh, uh, world war with millions of people involved, and so he was drafted, and then. He was being trained as an, an artillery unit. He belonged to the 148th Regiment, and uh, they left, they embarked in January of 1918. And uh, had a, his unit photo of his battery that right before he embarked, it was taken at uh, Camp Merritt. But they, they traveled in a convoy and uh, they were going to Europe and then they were going to go through some further training to uh, uh, be trained on heavy artillery. I think the challenge was emotionally getting prepared to be able to go over to Europe and become involved in that it's catastrophic warfare.
when you read about the American soldier's experience in World War I, there were three events that they always speak of. First of all was the transportation, how awful it was. Uh, I think if many of them had known what that would be like, they would have very definitely wanted to stay home. The second was the food, how awful the food was. And as one uh, Utahn commented, uh, it was much harder to face the chow line than it was the battle line. That was probably an exaggeration, but that was his feeling. And of course, the, th the third point then was the actual experience on the front, fighting in the trenches where uh, the French, the Germans, the English had been for now more than three years. The mud, the cold, the wet, uh, the rats, the lice, uh, the poor conditions there, uh, to say nothing of the snipers that were shooting at you, uh, the hand grenades that were being thrown, and the heavy artillery that was coming over. Uh, it was a very traumatic experience for all soldiers, and certainly the American soldiers. Each army had a variety of trench knives. These would be issued so that when you went into the trenches, you had something that uh, could inflict tremendous, or, uh, tremendous wounds, or even for capturing prisoners. A lot of it was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. You notice that the bayonets on the rifles, that's because the Napoleonic tactics of bayonet fighting was still being taught. So of course you're going up against a foe that would have a fixed bayonet. But if you could get in close with a trench knife, which has a knuckle duster, a blade, and usually a, a stud, so that you could even go and hit them hard enough on a helmet that would still knock them out. Every army had some form of trench knife for the hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The front lines uh, where Americans do get involved, mostly in the summer and the fall of 1918, uh, were just as brutal and bloody as the front lines had been in 1914. American soldiers encounter uh, or incur the same percentage of casualties as do the French. Uh, per time that they actually spend in combat. Artillery is the great killer. Machine guns claim the lives of many. Uh, Americans are immersed in the trenches a little bit less, but they encounter a German army, critically, uh, that's, that's at the point of fracture. And the American forces, as they arrive, will help to shatter that German army to the point that it's headlong in retreat into October and November of 1918 when the Germans request a ceasefire, and we call that the Armistice of November 1918. Upon the ceasefire, American troops prepared to return home. Uh, most do, uh, and, they, and as soon as they do, uh, the, the, the flotillas are organized into victory parades, uh, the, the warships steam into New York Harbor, and the transport ships mostly too. And from that point forward, uh, after grand celebrations in New York, practically every other local community across the country will have their own form of parades as their troops gather on trains and finally arrive at places like Union Station in Ogden. Uh, of course, it's at precisely the same time that troops are coming home uh, that the Spanish flu is raging, and so communities are affected by that, soldiers are affected by that too. But it didn't dim the enthusiasm for the victorious return uh, of their soldiers. Uh, Americans were celebratory. Uh, and enthusiastic about the outcome of this conflict as it seemed that they had helped to defeat Germany in swift order and, re and restore order across Europe. The return of the, the soldiers was uh, uh, a very positive experience uh, for most, at least those that had been in France. Many 
soldiers felt they had lost out in that they had been sent to France but had not seen any action. And a good number of other soldiers had never made it to France and they, they were disappointed in that. And so there was that, uh, that part of it. But all were welcome home as heroes, whether they had just served here in the United States or on the front lines in the trenches of France. And so I would say the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of World War I, the end of World War I, uh, those soldiers would have been very proud and thankful for the, uh, the recognition that they've been given and certainly in programs like this one here at the Tabernacle, which played such a key role in uh, the beginning of the war where patriotic celebrations were held at the beginning and at the end of the war.